All right, welcome ladies and gentlemen to Ralston Valley High School's AP Chemistry Lecture Series. You're now watching Chapter 10, Lecture Number 2. This is a lecture on types of crystalline solids. Let's begin. All right, we're going to have a look here at a different set of types of crystalline solids. Um, solids are a familiar state of matter to us, and we've talked a lot about, about phase changes between different phases of matter. But what we're going to be looking at here now is an understanding of how solids are put together and what sort of attractive forces hold together the particles within the solid itself. Uh, some of these solids you are very, very familiar with, solids like, let's say, sodium chloride. We've discussed on a number of occasions before that sodium chloride exists as a lattice of oppositely charged ions um, held together by those electrostatic attractive forces between the positively charged cations, like say the sodium in table salt, sodium chloride, and the negatively charged anions, like those chloride ions in sodium chloride. So within a crystalline lattice of sodium chloride, we see at each particular lattice point, we see an ion, either a sodium ion or a chloride ion. And the attractive forces holding that lattice together are ionic bonds. And again, that example, the super familiar one, would be sodium chloride. There's lots and lots of different types of ionic compounds that we're familiar with, though. Not just sodium chloride, but also things like magnesium chloride, or uh, that's road salt, essentially. Um, calcium carbonate, again, that would be an ionic compound in which we've got oppositely charged ions at each lattice, some of which happen to be polyatomic. So we see, again, then, that uh, ionic solids are held together by ionic bonds. Now, that explains a familiar substance like table salt, but what about a substance like sugar? Um, sugar, uh, like glucose, C6H12O6, is obviously not an ionic compound, and the molecules themselves we've talked about what holds them together, that is, the covalent bonds within the glucose molecules, but what holds the molecules together within the solid itself? And thinking for a moment there about glucose, C6H12O6, consider the types of intermolecular forces of attraction that exist between those molecules. Um, glucose has got lots and lots of hydroxyl functional groups around the molecule. And again, those hydroxyl functional groups are highly polar. And as such, we would expect to see hydrogen bonding existing between molecules of glucose. And furthermore, we're also going to expect to see London dispersion forces due to the motion of those electrons. So if we think about a molecular solid like glucose, rather than having an ion at each lattice point, we'd instead expect to see discrete covalently bonded molecules at each particular lattice point. That is, a whole molecule of glucose exists at each one of the points of the lattice on the solid. And what holds those things together are essentially the intermolecular forces we've been recently discussing, things like London dispersion forces or dipole-dipole interactions or hydrogen bonds. Um, and that explains then how glucose holds together into solid phase because, again, those are going to be fairly strong forces of attraction between those molecules, again, recognizing the strength of the hydrogen bonding due to all those hydroxyl groups. Similarly, we might see something like carbon dioxide. Uh, carbon dioxide, dry ice, again, has a CO2 molecule at each lattice point, and those molecules are held together by the London dispersion forces between those molecules. Remember, carbon dioxide is itself a nonpolar molecule, and the only type of intermolecular forces of attraction that exist between those molecules are the London dispersion forces. And because those London dispersion forces are relatively weaker than those strong hydrogen bonds present in glucose molecules, We'd expect then to see the attractive forces between CO2 molecules to be weaker, which means it takes less energy to overcome them. Meaning, therefore, carbon dioxide exists at gas phase at room temperature and pressure. We have to cool it down to very, very low temperatures until those intermolecular forces of attraction are strong enough to hold the CO2 molecules into a crystalline lattice in the solid phase. So that's um, molecular solids. We've got a couple more to look at here. The next one we refer to as an atomic solid or a covalent network solid. In a covalent network solid, the particle at each lattice point is a non-metal atom. Uh, think about, for example, something like carbon, either in the form of diamond or graphite, or silicon. Now, looking at those atomic solids, again, what's going to hold them together are attractive forces between the particles, which in this case are going to be not IMFs, but instead actual covalent bonds. 
the covalent bonds will hold those particles together, which means that these atomic covalent network solids are very, very difficult to break apart. Think about how, about, how very hard diamond is. So atomic uh, solids, like covalent network solids, tend to have very, very high melting and boiling points as a result. And then one final type of atomic solid here, rather than having non-metal atoms at each lattice point, if instead we have metal atoms, we would now expect to see what we refer to as a metallic solid. And these are very, very familiar substances, like literally, say, like a chunk of iron. Um, again, what holds those iron atoms together is the metallic bonding, that is that sea of electrons we described, the delocalized electrons that are attracted not only to their own nucleus, but also to all of the uh, neighboring nuclei around them. So again, here we find lots of different types of solids, depending upon the particular particles at each lattice point and the attractive forces holding them together, we can make some predictions about the properties of those different solids. All right, so now that we've had a look at the different types of crystalline solids, let's have a look at one particular type of atomic solid that is a metallic solid we refer to as an alloy. Uh, by definition, an alloy is a homogeneous mixture of metals. You've been introduced to several of these during your first-year chemistry class last year. Um, we're going to go into a little bit more detail this year about the types of alloys we see and some of the properties based upon some of the makeup of these particular species. Uh, starting off, let's go ahead and look at a couple of definitions here. Um, we're going to distinguish between what we refer to as a substitutional alloy as opposed to an interstitial alloy. In a substitutional alloy, the host metal, which is essentially the dominant metal present in the uh, atomic lattice there, some of those atoms of the host metal are replaced by other metal atoms of a very similar size. An example of this particular type of alloy would be something like, say, brass. Uh, you see the picture of that astrolab made of brass there on the right-hand side of our screen. Um, brass is a homogeneous mixture of zinc and copper in which the host metal copper um, is very, very similar in size to the substituting metal zinc. So essentially those little zinc atoms more or less fit um, into the little places that would be occupied by copper atoms, and as such, they don't really disrupt the actual shape or structure of that uh, crystalline lattice. They fit in more or less to the same size spaces that the copper atoms do. Now that is as opposed to what we refer to as an interstitial alloy, in which you've got generally a host metal again, um, which is then going to have interspersed within it in the holes between the atoms in the close packed structure, um, some small atoms occupying those little spaces in between. You can kind of imagine this interstitial alloy as being like, say, like a ball pit at Chuck E. Cheese's um, that you threw a whole bunch of BBs into. The BBs would find the little spaces in between those much larger atoms um, and take up the spaces in between them. So, in general, um, we see differences in properties in terms of substitutional alloys versus interstitial alloys. Um, a familiar interstitial alloy would be something like steel. Um, the primary component, the host metal of steel, is iron. And generally when we make steel, the second particle that gets placed into that homogeneous mixture there are carbon atoms. Those carbon atoms uh, being in period two are much smaller than the iron atoms uh, from a couple periods down lower on the periodic table. And as such, those carbon atoms kind of slip into the spaces in between the iron atoms within the crystalline lattice. Now, in general, um, the greater displacement or disruption of the host metal atoms in the alloy tends to make the substance less malleable. And you can kind of think about it like this. Um, within a substitutional alloy like brass, um, really, some of the atoms being replaced with zinc rather than copper doesn't really disrupt the lattice whatsoever. Um, we still see the same sea of electrons sharing those electrons between all the adjacent atoms, whether they be copper atoms or whether they be zinc atoms, because the copper atom and the zinc atom are very, very similar in terms of their properties, in particular in terms of things like their size and their electronegativity. Um, and as such, brass behaves very much like most metals do, that is, it's malleable and ductile. But if we look at steel, the steel particles made up of those irons with the kind of car uh, carbons finding those little places in between them, um, those carbons disrupt the alloy. 
Um, and if we disrupt the alloy, that kind of changes the structure such that we wouldn't expect to see if we hammer on one side of it, um, it deform in such a readily, uh, easily manner. Um, the carbon atoms present right there are going to cause it to essentially harden in that it becomes less malleable by essentially disrupting the sea of electrons that we see in a traditional metal a lattice. So again, we can predict some of the properties of these alloys um, based upon what atoms make up those particular particles within the lattice. And what we're going to look at here on this next slide is a topic which has come up more frequently in recent AP chemistry questions than it has in the past. Um, that's the concept of a semiconductor. So I'd like you to have a look at the diagram that we've got on the page right here. Um, this is a diagram of elemental silicon. And as it turns out, silicon, looking at the species right there, again, exists as an atomic network solid. Um, that is, at each lattice point there, we have a silicon atom present. And in terms of that atomic network solid, what's holding this thing together here are covalent bonds between the adjacent silicon atoms. Now, we don't talk too much about molecular orbitals in this uh, AP chemistry class right here, but what I want you to understand here is that when we're looking at the atomic orbitals present in silicon atoms there, the atomic orbitals describe the positions those electrons occupy or the shapes of the regions in space where those electrons occupy um, based upon the relative energy levels of those electrons. Now, when we start to form bonds between atoms, not surprisingly, the shapes of those orbitals are different than they would be as lone atoms by themselves because we're changing the potential energy of the system by forming those bonds. And as such, um, we expect to form what we refer to as molecular orbitals as opposed to atomic orbitals. Now, we're not going to go too much into the uh, bonding theory that goes around with molecular orbital theory here. Um, but what I do want you to understand there is that when you have a molecular orbital within a molecule which is entirely filled, that essentially prevents electrons from moving from place to place within that uh, position. And as such, you see those species act as non-conductors. But if they're empty molecular orbitals, then an electron can occupy a position there and move from one position to another, um, hopping from atom to atom in those ele empty molecular orbitals, allowing for the flow of charge, and therefore those species act as conductors. Now, that being said, in general, silicon kind of sits somewhere in between those positions. Um, silicon has a gap in terms of the energy level that exists between the filled molecular orbitals, that is where all those bonds are within the silicon atoms there, and then the empty molecular orbitals that exist at higher potential energy. Now, in order to move an electron from one of those filled orbitals where they can't move up into the empty molecular orbital, where we call that the conduction band, it's going to require some energy to do so. Some electrons might just happen to get some energy just due to their random motion in order to escape up into that higher energy uh, molecular orbital there. And we would expect them to see silicon be a poor conductor, but not a non-conductor entirely. But here's the question that's being posed to you here um, as we look at this lattice here. What would effect would an increase in temperature have on the conductivity of this silicon? And logically speaking, if we increase the temperature, then there's more energy available within the system. And as such, we'd expect more of those electrons would possess the energy required to cross that gap from the filled molecular orbitals up into the empty conduction band, where those molecular orbitals are not entirely filled. And therefore, we'd expect to see silicon act as a better conductor as we moved to higher temperatures. So again, then, silicon acts as a semiconductor during normal temperatures, in which case we see only very few electrons with enough energy to occupy, the, to jump up to those higher energy conduction band molecular orbitals. But as temperatures increase, we see silicon's ability to conduct electrical current improve. All right, now that we have talked about the uh, property of silicon that we saw on that last slide, that is that silicon acts as a semiconductor, um, generally a non-conductor where those electrons occupy the filled molecular orbitals, but sometimes seeing some of those electrons with enough energy to jump up into that conduction band where we have those empty molecular orbitals allowing for that flow of electrical current. We can change the conductivity of a silicon sample by something which is called doping. That is, introducing other types of atoms into the crystalline lattice structure, mixing them in there, essentially substituting for some of those silicon atoms. 
and the atoms we choose to substitute into that crystalline lattice are going to affect the properties of our semiconductor. In particular, on this slide, we're going to look at something called an n-type semiconductor. n-type stands for negative. So if we take a silicon sample and we dope it with an atom that has an extra valence electron, that is an extra electron in the valence shell as opposed to silicon's four, in that system, we would essentially be introducing an excess of a higher energy electron into that material. And as such, with more electrons available at relatively high energy levels, it would seem then logical that we would see more electrons with enough energy to find their way up into that empty molecular orbital, our conduction band, meaning essentially we're going to be able to make this particular sample of silicon a better conductor of electrical current with the introduction of those extra negative charges into the system. So again, we can dope the system with high energy electrons by introducing something like, let's say, an arsenic atom. Again, those silicon atoms have four valence electrons. Arsenic is one family over in, pure, in, sorry, in group 5A, and as such, that arsenic atom does have an extra high energy electron, which would then be able to move about within that conduction band with relative ease. So we can increase the conductivity through the production of what we refer to as an N-type semiconductor, doping it with extra negative charges in the form of those arsenic atoms. And on the previous slide, having seen an example of an N-type semiconductor, we now come to the opposite thing here, which would be what we refer to as a P-type semiconductor. The P again standing for extra positives. So again, if we start with that crystalline lattice of silicon atoms, that atomic network solid, and we dope the silicon this time with a substance which contains fewer electrons in the valence shell than the silicon atoms. In essence, what we're going to end up doing there is introducing kind of some holes into the lattice. That is, positive holes where electrons are not currently occupying a position in a bond. And as such, there's now places within not the conduction band but instead electron holes in the actual lattice already present of the silicon crystal. And as such, we don't need to now move those electrons up to the higher energy conduction band molecular orbitals. Instead, the electrons can now move from place to place within the, up until this point, previously filled molecular orbitals, which now have those holes that they can now move to. And as an example of how this might occur, think about doping silicon with boron. Generally, silicon has those four valence electrons, meaning it can bond to four other silicon atoms in the crystalline lattice. If we introduce boron atoms into the lattice, those boron atoms only have three valence electrons, essentially meaning that within the lattice then, the molecular orbitals there, there would be a position which is unoccupied by an electron. And as such, an electron from one of the neighboring bonds could then migrate over into that new position, again showing us then we have the ability to show the flow of charge. That is, this substance has become a better conductor of electrical current, not because we added more electrons to it, but because we opened up a place for those electrons to go within the position where previously they could not move around. So again, n-type semiconductors introduce more negative charges in the form of extra electrons present in atoms from group 5 on the periodic table, as opposed to these p-type semiconductors that become better conductors of electrical current by introducing atoms from group 3 on the periodic table, where there are fewer electrons present, opening up positions for the electrons to move to. And now we come to kind of a big idea. And this is a big idea, not just in terms of AP chemistry, but really a big idea in terms of the way our modern world has changed. Um, what we're going to look at here is what we refer to as a PN junction for our semiconductors. Recall the P-type semiconductor was the semiconductor that had extra positive holes present in the crystalline lattice. And the N-type semiconductor was the semiconductor where we had doped it with an extra set of electrons from introducing um, atoms on group 5A in the periodic table where there are more high-energy electrons present in the system. So what we're going to look at now is what happens if we sandwich next to each other a P-type semiconductor with an N-type semiconductor. Recognizing that the N-type semiconductor has extra high-energy electrons present in it, and the P-type semiconductor has lower energy holes in the crystalline lattice where those electrons could occupy a lower potential energy state, 
it would seem logical then that we would see a net migration of electrons from the n-type semiconductor to those holes on the p-type semiconductor, because that's going to put those electrons at a lower potential energy position. Now, that being said, that can't just occur indefinitely, because as more and more of those negative charges migrate over to the p-type semiconductor, the p-type semiconductor builds up a net negative charge, and the n-type semiconductor builds up a net positive charge. And as such, we end up developing a voltage across that particular region. That is a buildup of charge we call a contact potential. And the extra negative charges now building up on the P side are going to repel from other electrons, keeping them from all just migrating over to that side. So in essence, what ends up happening there is we end up building up a voltage. We end up seeing more electrons form, find their way to the P side, fewer electrons find their way to the N side, and we end up with a more negative charge on one side of the junction than on the other. Now in the next slide here, we'll see how that idea of building up charge across that junction can be a very, very useful tool in terms of creating electronic devices. All right, for our last conversation here around semiconductors, uh, we're going to look at something called forward versus reverse bias. And I think the easiest way of approaching this is actually just have a look at an example problem here. So we're going to ask you here in this problem, if we have a PN junction hooked up to a battery, which of the configurations that we've diagrammed below will allow for the flow of electrical current? And we want you to justify your reasoning. So on the left-hand diagram there, you'll see we've got a P-type semiconductor sandwiched next to an N-type semiconductor. So again, that is a P-N junction. The P-type semiconductor is hooked up to the negative terminal of our battery, and the N-type semiconductor is hooked up to the positive terminal of the battery. And what we want to look at here is whether this will allow for the flow of electrical current. Now, remember, within a P-type semiconductor, there are extra positive holes present in that system. That is, places where electrons can migrate to, whereas in the N-type semiconductor, we've got an excess of high-energy electrons present. Now, the excess of extra high-energy electrons present right there in that N-type semiconductor in this setup are going to have a tendency to migrate towards the positively charged terminal that attracts them. And likewise, even though the hole itself is not really a thing that can move, the positions where those holes are on the p-type semiconductor are going to likely see a migration towards the negative terminal, again, because of opposites attract here. And as a result, we end up essentially with a depleted zone within the central region there where we don't really see a whole lot of electron holes or extra electrons present in the center. And as such, we will not see the charges flow across the junction from the n-type to the p-type, and this would therefore be in what we refer to as a reverse bias. Uh, in this reverse bias, we would expect not to see the flow of electrical current. Now, that being said, take a look at the diagram on the right-hand side now. On the right-hand side, we have the p-type semiconductor hooked up to the positive terminal, and the n-type semiconductor hooked up to the negative terminal. Now remember that n-type semiconductor has an excess of negative electrons, and those electrons are attracted towards the positive terminal. And likewise, those holes where there are not electrons present are positively charged positions here. That will have a tendency to migrate the holes towards the negative terminal. And as such, the net effect of that is we're going to see the electrons flow towards the boundary between the P and the N barrier, and likewise the holes as well. And once we get those electrons close to those holes, the electron can then hop from the high potential energy position where it currently occupies on the N position on the N uh, side of the semiconductor towards the hole, um, which is on the P side of that junction. And the net effect of that is electrons will flow from the N side to the P side, where they can then continue to flow towards the positive terminal, which attracts them. So the net effect of this is we're going to end up seeing electrons moving across the PN junction towards the positive terminal, making the current flow within this circuit. This is what we refer to as forward bias. So the right side will lead to the flow of electrical current in forward bias. The left side diagram will not lead to the flow of electrical uh, current in reverse bias. Now, let's take a look now at another scenario here. Let's say in example two, what's going to happen now if we apply an alternating current across that PN junction? 
Now, an alternating current implies that the position of the negative terminal and the positive terminal is essentially swapping position, uh, at least for a normal alternating current here in the US, 60 times per second. So what had been the positive terminal, a 60th of a second later, is going to end up becoming the negative terminal. And if we hook up that PN junction to this AC power supply, what that essentially means is, once every 60th of a second, we're going to flip-flop from being in forward bias to being in reverse bias. So I'm going to go ahead and draw now a diagram of essentially the voltage in an alternating current circuit here over time. And you'll see here that the voltage changes from a positive voltage to a negative voltage uh, as the current flip-flops back and forth in terms of the direction of current flow. Now, when this system is in the setup where we are in reverse bias, recall that the PN junction stops the flow of electricity across the junction itself. So if that were the case, the net effect of that is we are going to stop the flow of electrical current, meaning that for that fraction of time while the system is in reverse bias, no electrical current flows. But then, a fraction of a second later, when the position of the positive and negative terminals flips due to the alternating current here, we would then see the system set up in forward bias, which would allow for the flow of electrons across the PN junction, allowing current now to flow in that particular direction. And as such, remember in an alternating current, the direction of current flow changes from one direction to another once every 60th of a second. But by applying that AC current across the PN junction, we are essentially blocking the flow of current in one direction. So if we input an AC current, what we get out of the system is only current flowing in one direction. That is a DC current, a direct current. And as it turns out, this has a really important effect in terms of the real world usage. Um, a lot of devices which we use in our daily lives, things like your cell phone in particular, uh, charge using DC current but the current which we get coming out of our outlet supplies is an alternating current supplied to us by the power company. So in order to use a device that uses DC current, hooking it up into an AC current outlet in your house, we have to have something that comes in between your cell phone and the wall, essentially, which is a device called a rectifier. That rectifier essentially is just a PN junction that takes an input of alternating current and then as we output a DC current across that uh, PN junction, what gets out of the rectifier to your phone is essentially a direct current that can be used to charge the phone itself. So if you think about that little tiny device that you're using to charge your phone, inside of there is a little PN junction, a rectifier, that transforms AC current into DC current for use with your phone. So, kind of cool little application of um, semiconductor technology to explain something we see in our daily lives. So that's pretty much it for this particular lesson here. Um, kind of big key takeaway ideas from this. It is very important that we have memorized the differences between the types of crystalline solids. So that is atomic network solids versus covalent network solids versus molecular solids versus metallic solids. And it would be also be a really, really good idea to just kind of commit to memory a couple of common examples of those different types of solids, um, because a lot of times the AP test will ask you to justify differences in terms of behavior of different species or properties of species, assuming that you can know which of those would be atomic network solids versus covalent network solids versus um, molecular solids versus metallic solids, etc. So um, commit those ones to memory, and then again, just have some sort of general idea about the understanding of how a semiconductor works, and then use that uh, knowledge to justify observed behaviors uh, to explain something like, say, a PN junction, a rectifier. All right, that's it for this lecture, folks. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next one.